Welcome, welcome to our forum in cybersecurity and various topics. Um, it's a joint, jointly hosted by Acronis and Acronis SCS. Uh, today we have the pleasure of hearing uh, Professor Moshe Vardy of Rice University um, on um, efficiency versus resilience. Uh, just, I was asked to be very brief in my introduction. Uh, professor Vardy is a professor of computer science at Rice University, um, winner of many awards. I'm just gonna mention two, uh, the Girdles Prize and the Knuth Prize. Uh, and he's gonna um, educate us on his take of efficiency various versus resilience. Moshe? Thank you. Thank you for the, giving me this uh, forum and thank you for the kind introduction. Over the last few years, we went through various disasters. Uh, the 737 MAX, the Texas uh, uh, power grid failure, and of course the biggest one is COVID-19. And I see kind of a thread that goes through, through the, th to the three disasters. And it has to do with the, with the dichotomy, the tension, the trade-off between efficiency and resilience. And that's what I will try to elaborate today. So just to remind you, the 737 MAX. So in 2018 and, and, and 19, which now seems like a decade ago, uh, the same plane, the Boeing 37 MAX, the same system, the maneuvering characteristic augmentation system, MCAS, two crashes with a death toll over 300 people. I mean, here you kind of, the, 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 this cartoon showing the, the company really in some sense has been, has been uh, uh, reduced to, and we'll come back to what really happens in the, with the Boeing 7, 77 MAX. Uh, the other one is what happened here in Texas just uh, a few months ago. This was called Winter Storm Uri. Um, it was in the middle of February. Uh, suddenly a, a, a cold front, what we call polar vortex, polar air came down, swept all the way to the Gulf. You can see here that in fact, the center of Texas around Houston was the coldest. Where this is, I think, snowfall was the heaviest around Houston. Uh, the Texas power grid was not uh, fortified to deal with such a, with such weather. It was considered the, the costliest US natural disaster, close to $200 billion was the cost of this few days of power outages. And the death toll was, a, was the highest for any winter storm in US history. It's not the highest for natural disaster, but for winter storm, this, is, this was the highest. And of course, the biggest disaster that we've been living through now for the past uh, year and a half is COVID-19. And COVID-19 is not really just one, one crisis, it's a confluence of multiple crises, right? You have at the heart of it is the, is, the, is the public health crisis, the pandemic, and we all obsessively look at dashboard and how many cases and how many, how many deaths and is it going up or down and the like. But it was accompanied in the United States, I'm sure the rest of the world, but I know more about the US in this case, by, by a very deep economic crisis. Uh, here is an article from the Washington Post last November. 26 million now say they don't have enough to eat as the pandemic was and the holidays near. And what you see here is not the parking lot in Disneyland. It's a line of cars waiting for hours, for hours to get food from a food bank. So. It was a, a, a deep, deep, deep economic crisis. And on top of it, it became a social crisis, the Black Lives Movement. So on one hand, it was not related, but everybody, everybody nerves were on edge. And uh, again, there was a yet another instance, another instance of, a, of policemen killing a, a black citizen. In this case, it was George Floyd. And just the whole thing just blew up and we're still living in the, in the aftermath of that, of that event. In fact, the cop was just sentenced to 22 half and a half years in prison for that. And of course, on top of that, we live through, through a political crisis. This is, you see a picture from January 6 of this year, which to me was the scariest day in, I'm approaching 40 years in the United States. This was the scariest day. It was scarier than 9-11 because 9-11, it was a catastrophic day. 
but I never thought it was an existential threat to the United States. In January 6, it was existential threats to US democracy. It could have ended very, very differently. It was a very, very close call to, uh, Trump was very close to invoking the Insurrection Act, which would basically establish military government. So uh, we really dodged a huge bullet there. And a huge question is, why were we so caught so unready for the pandemic? So here is a book, the, the Viral Storm, The Dawn of a New Pandemic Age by Nathan Wolf. And this sounds like a book that should have written now. But actually this book was published in, in 2011. This is not a new book. People have been predicting a pandemic. This is one, there are many such prediction. In fact, you can find not just you know, popular books, but this is a testimony by Michael Olevit, who was the secretary of US Department of Health and Human Services during the George W. Bush administration. And he's giving a testimony for the Senate Special Committee on Aging preparing for the pandemic flu. So people, lots of people say we have to be re get ready for a pandemic because the pandemic is coming and yet we were not ready. And I want to take you to the early days of March, 2020, when it became suddenly very clear that we are, that we are in a very serious pandemic. I don't think people knew how serious it's going to be, it was all, all the clear then that this is a, 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 an epochal crisis. And people start talking about flattening the curve. Here is, I went back and found an article from March, 2020, uh, flattening the curve. And so pandemic usually proceed in a kind of a bell-shaped curve because you have cases and eventually the virus run out of new horse and it goes down. And that the claim was we should flatten the curve. It should not be so steep. And what was the argument? Many hundreds of thousands of infection will happen. Of course, nobody know that by now we will be in the United States alone in, in, uh, in, in tens of millions of cases, but many hundreds of thousands of infection will happen, but they don't have to happen all at once. Because you may remember in the early days, hospital were overwhelmed. Hospital in the New York area were overwhelmed. Here is an article from April, 2020. Nurses are wearing garbage bags as the battle coronavirus. It's like something out of twilight zone. Why? Because we did not have enough PPE, personal protective equipment. We did not have enough PPEs to protect the medical staff. In fact, one reason that at the beginning they told us, oh, we don't need masks because they wanted medical staff to get all the masks. They were afraid of a rush, people running, run on, on trying to get masks. So in March of 2020, William Galston, an economist from the Brooklyn Institute, wrote a column in the Wall Street Journal called efficiency is not the only economic virtue. And he asked, what if relentless economic pursuit of efficiency, which has dominated American business thinking for decades, has made the global economic system more vulnerable to shocks? And he explained efficient comes to the optimal adaptation to an existing environment. Well, resilience, which is defined as the ability to recover readily from illness, depression, adversity, or the like, while resilience requires the capacity to adapt to disruptive changes in the environment. So are you trying to optimize the current environment or are you going to be flexible and ready to adapt to diff changes in the environment? So this is the, the, the you put forward, a Garrison put forward, we've been focusing too much on efficiency and not enough on resilience. And a very similar point was made a couple of months later by Tom Friedman in the New York Times, where he wrote how we broke the world. Greed and globalization set us up for disaster. Over the past 20 years, he wrote, we've been steadily removing made men and natural buffers, redundancy, regulation, and norms that provide resilience and protection when big system, be the ecological, geopolitical, or financial get stressed. Remember Tom Friedman, was, was the author of The World is Flat. He was kind of the high priest of, of globalization. Now he, he's telling us we've been obsessively, recklessly removing this buffer out of an obsession with short-term efficient growth without thinking at all. So again, we have sacrificed resilience for the sake of efficiency. So let's take one, I think, a, a very good example of it. 
And this is just in time manufacturing. So the idea in just in time manufacturing that I think in the business community goes back, I believe to the eighties was the realization that when you have a warehouse of spare parts and components, it's actually very inefficient. Why is it inefficient? Well, it costs money to buy the warehouse. It costs money to maintain the warehouse. You buy the parts that sit in the warehouse, but they sit idle. This is money that sits idle. It doesn't give, it doesn't bear interest or anything. It's idle money. Then you have, you have, to, you have to put them in the warehouse. You have to take them out of the warehouse. So why don't we reduce warehouse inventory? In fact, maybe we should even eliminate it. Can we design our logistics so the parts arrive at the manufacturing line just in time? So companies like Dell Computers became a, a, a large a successful company, not really for technical innovation, for logistical innovation. They were the most efficient producer. So just in time manufacturing, is highly efficient, but it assume base case logistics, ex efficiency at the expense of resilience. Think now what happened when one ship gets stuck in the, in the Suez Canal. Same issue, we have the same issue. So let's look at an example. Um, one example was why there are still not enough paper toilets, paper towels, and the Wall Street Journal wrote in August of 2020, blame lean manufacturing. It's the same lean manufacturing, just in time manufacturing is the same thing. And again, he, they, 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 Sharon Terlep and Annie Gasparo wrote a decades long effort to eke out more profit by keeping inventory low, left many manufacturers unprepared when COVID-19 struck and production is unlikely to ramp significantly anytime soon. This is a real picture from Costco. Costco is a, is a kind of retail uh, warehouse and you can see it's practically empty because it's not, not, enough, not enough toilet paper, not enough paper towels. And we see the same issue, what happened to hospitals? So September, 2020, uh, the Wall Street Journal wrote a sequence of articles trying to understand what happened to hospital. And the question is, why did COVID overwhelm hospitals? A years long drive for efficiency. And Terlep and Evans explain health system have kept a tight train on employee numbers and expanded outpatient care, helping their finances, but making them less prepared for the medical, a medical crisis. Similarly, the death toll early in the crisis was among, among American nursing home. This was called an American tragedy. By the time we reached, I don't know right now, by the time we reached about 300,000 dead, 100,000 were from nursing homes, one third were from nursing homes. And again, business week, right? The industry could have done more to stop the virus. What she's doing all right, COVID-19 death, top 100,000 in US long-term term facilities. And again, explanation, not enough staff. Really, they have very lean staff that worked okay when there's no crisis, but could not work during the crisis. What did we see in Texas? We basically, we had there were warnings about polar vortex. This is not, again, this was not unforeseen phenomenon. It's just expensive to fortify the power grid. And now, in fact, we're going to see a week after the, 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 the freeze, a large legal company, Morgan & Morgan, is filed a class action lawsuit against ERCOT. Our ERCOT is the, is the Electric Reliability Council of Texas. They are in charge of the Texas power grid and Texas out of its uh, arrogance is not connected to the US power grid. It's a standalone power grid. And so when it systematically failed, there was no other way to get, when the power uh, plants fail, we do not have enough power. The power grid was fine. The grid was fine, but the power plants fail. And again, Texas out of this, for the sake of efficiency, failed to prepare for cold weather. So, we can look and see what happened in, in, in other settings. We had the, the financial crisis of 2008. What happened there? And so the answer there is again, that uh, we have a, these are all companies that were in the risk management business and they, they had financial model, but the financial model didn't handle what happened in the extreme cases. So if you see here the formula, the formula handled 
the normal cases, but when you have abnormal condition, the formula did not give good results. And so this company suddenly were, couldn't handle the, the situation. And there was several, several companies could not handle, they had model that worked well in normal time, but failed in extreme, in extreme crisis. You look at American society, remember we saw that 26 million people could, did not have enough food. What's going on here? So it turns out that American society is very fragile. It's very precarious. They live, it's called a precariat. They live on very precariously. So uh, nearly half of American would have trouble finding $400 to pay for an emergency. If you ask people, uh, what about unexpected $1,000? Two thirds of Americans cannot handle an unanticipated bill of $1,000. An article in the, in the June 2020 of Atlantic, Adam Serwe wrote, it didn't have to be like that. Why is it American society has not been ready? And he wrote, the desperation of US workers in the aftermath of the cor coronavirus was a product of a series of policy decisions and missed opportunities. This, our society has been so obsessed with efficiency that American family, American family are living on the edge. So I want to go and ask, ask how does nature handle this tension between efficiency, efficiency and resilience? And to do that, I will bring out an article that appeared in a computing computer science magazine sex as an algorithm, the theory of evolution under the lens of computation. This is, in spite of the pink cover, this is a very serious, serious article trying to understand what is the evolutionary role of sex. An article was written by Adi Livnat and Christos Papadimitriou. It appeared in November of 2016. And it says, well, we can look at uh, evolution as a search for some kind of a search algorithm. Turns out if you look, there are two computer search algorithms that are inspired by nature. One is called simulated annealing, which is a sequence of small adaptations or small mutations. And genetic algorithm combine mutation with crossbreeding. It try to mimic sexual reproduction. By now we have a lot of experience with these two algorithms. And the answer is that simulation learning is much more efficient. Many years ago, I wrote a paper in which I used genetic algorithm for uh, optimization. And the paper was rejected and the reviewer said you should have tried simulated annealing. And we said, well, grumble, grumble, grumble. Well, I guess we need to do it because the reviewer told us to do it, but we didn't expect it to be any better. We thought we can tell him it's not doing any better. It was a thousand times better algorithm when we do simulate annealing. It was shockingly better. So why is nature, why did nature choose any inefficient algorithm? It turns out the sex is actually very inefficient as an algorithm compared to simulated annealing. So the answer that Livnat and Papadun you give, it's not about efficiency. What simulated, what sexual reproduction does, it creates a species with greater genetic diversity. And that means that individuals are less optimally adapt, adapted to the environment, but the species as a whole is more adaptable. If the environment changes, some, some, organ, some organism will not survive, but others will. And, and because they will, the species will survive. And so sexual reproduction give a more resilient uh, species. So you can think of efficient resilience as two forms of optimization. One is focused on short term, and the other one is focused on long term. So, um, so we have short term and long term. And, and what does nature prefer? Nature prefers survival. Indeed, uh, Darwin says, you know, it is not the strongest of the species that survived, not the most intelligent. It is the one that's most adaptable to change. So what we need is for, from, from a, what, we, what, what we really need here is for survival, we need, we need to focus on resilience and not on efficiency. 
So, so nature prefers long-term optimization. This is the answer. Now let's go, let's look at computer science. What does computer, computer science focus on? So you can open the art of computer programming by Don Knuth. Don Knuth is closest to we have to a patron sense in computing. I received the Knuth prize and it's just an amazing honor. I mean, partly you go after the name of the award, inspire honor, Don Knuth is just a legend in computer science. And you know, these volumes are, have shaped computer science algo, algorithms. And we look, what are the books about? They're all about efficiency. The concept of resilience simply does not show up in Knuth's work. It was brilliant, but his, short, his sole focus was efficiency, efficiency, efficiency. So let's take one algorithm as an example. PageRank is an algorithm developed by Google and it's named after Larry Page. It's a kind of a pun also after web pages. And, and PageRank works you find what is it, what is it, if you have a, a, a site, a site is if many other websites point to you, it makes you important. If many important websites point to you, it makes you very important, so on and so forth. So, so PageRank works by looking, analyzing the link structure of the, of the, of the web and looking for uh, going to this fixed point of, of links that points to link that points to link. So PageRank has been incredibly successful algorithm. And then people realize they can manipulate the something called search agent optimization. You can manipulate page rank by introducing fast websites and fake links. So you can, you can spoof page rank. So page rank internet is not resilient and the uh, Google is now not using any more uh, page rank. It's a trade today. What is the Google algorithm? It's a trade secret. I want to look at other facets of this because efficiency is not just about runtime. I want to talk about other facets of efficiency. And for example, one of them is friction. So in 2013, I wrote that our discipline is dedicated to reducing friction. I would say we are obsessed with reducing friction. We're trying to reduce latency, bandwidth, increase bandwidth, ubiquity is a goal. And our goal is to reduce the friction of computing communication as much as possible. What was the slogan for Facebook for many years? Frictionless sharing. But now when we think about Facebook, we realize that frictionless sharing is not a good thing. If it's too easy to share, then there are all kinds of adverse, adverse effect, filter bubble, fake news, extreme content. We made it too easy to share. So efficiency was, was pursued obsessively and we neglected resilience. What happened when you are obsessed with reducing friction? So another area where we try to reduce friction, where do you try to reduce friction? Like the stock market. So today we have high frequency trading, trying to speed it up, speed it up, speed it up as much as possible. In 2010, in May, 2010, the stock market crashed in five minutes, 600 points. What happened? It was the outcome of high frequency trading. Uh, one of the founders of this approach of this high frequency trading uh, later went on to say, today the speed of the drive for speed has no social value. So there is a, there is a arm race who has, who has faster trading An economists studied it and they wrote the high frequency trading arm race is a symptom of flawed market design. So again, this obsession with, with reducing friction is, is problematic. Uh, another area with, with of, of friction is something that may be negative is in other areas of human affairs, Tinder. Tinder is trying to reduce the friction of dating. And here is an article from 2010 in Washington Post. This uh, writer complained, why is it so hard to turn a Tinder date into a relationship? And she writes, it's part of the swarms of matches over the years. I've never had an update turn into, into an actual relationship. And this, uh, this uh, personal impression is backed up by research that couple that meets on Tinder have a hard time staying together. And the answer is we intuitively understand it. In fact, there, was a, there is a country song. You can go and Google the country song. Easy come, easy goes. Here's the line from the, from the, from the, from the, from the song. No hard feelings, darling, no regrets. 
why if you if everybody know that the investment was was low then the stakes are low so okay this relation doesn't work i'll have another match i'll have another match tomorrow i'll have another match why make too much of a big deal about it friction is too low we make it too easy turns out you need people to invest in relationship for this relationship to thrive and you know in a tries to have an engineering quad and a course from computer science there is mechanical engineering so imagine that I go across the quad and I tell my, my mechanical engineering colleagues, look, you guys should do what we do. You should try to eliminate friction everywhere or reduce it as much as possible everywhere. They will say, you're out of your mind. Friction is very important. The question is where? Between the tires and the road, I want high friction. In the drivetrain, I want low friction. I need to be smart about friction. It depends where, it has to be the right amount at the right place at the right time. And we are, we are committed to reducing friction. We are obsessed with reducing friction. So I'm arguing that we need to welcome back friction in computing. David Ackley wrote an article in CSCM in 2013. And again, he said that uh, we are, we've been obsessed with efficiency. And he said that we need to focus on, not on correctness and efficiency, he call it CEO software. In this case is key or correctness and efficiency only. And he said, what about, what about robustness? What about resilience? So now we can go back to the 737 max and see how this, this tension of resilience and efficiency reflect on the 737 max. So what happened? Boeing needed to build a new plane that will be more fuel efficient. So they, de they designed a new engine. It was expensive to design a new frame. So they decided to take the new engine, put it on an old frame of the 737. So what happens now? Now we have a mismatch of a new engine and an old frame. So Boeing said, no problem. The, the instability that would cause, we will, we will have an, a controller that would stabilize the plane. But the controller depended on one sensor because it was simpler and cheaper to depend on one sensor. And this one sensor failed, they, they, the pilots couldn't stabilize the plane and two planes crashed, hundreds of people died. It's not clear that Boeing in some sense will ever fully recover from that, from at least the, the loss, the loss in, in reputation is incalculable. In retrospect, therefore, the engineer overall optimized for fuel economy and time to market at the expense of safety. David Geller of the New York Times wrote last November, the Boeing 37 Max is a sign of capitalism gone awry, how the profit motive uh, pushed a, a Boeing to, to be so, uh, uh, to ignore obvious risk of their whole approach. I want to talk about security. I know that this is important to people here. Um, I'm first quoting a real email that I got from one of my colleagues, a respectable security researcher. I wrote something about cybersecurity and he said, no, no, you don't understand it. Here is how it goes. First, somebody built a thing and it's super useful. And he goes on to say, well, eventually come by along, find a vulnerability. This is part of the engineering process. So um, it turns out we go back to, to last, last, in last December, we find out that uh, a, a survey of nearly 1,200 free and open source software found security to below on the developer list of priorities. So sec, 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 people, security people do not seem to take security seriously. Security is incredibly important picture. And we find out that it is not taken seriously. Like the developer, of free and open source software security is at the bottom of their list. Why? They're focusing on functionality and feature because that's what sells software. So here we are in terms of cybersecurity. If you look at computer science, we pay, we pay attention to the Turing Award, Turing Award, the Nobel Prize in Computing. We are now 75 years from the beginning of the computer age out of the different Turing Award, four were given in, in, in cryptography but not in cybersecurity. Why? We still do not know how to build secure information system. And now the risk is, is about integrity of vital infrastructure. So 
for example, last May, we have a major pipeline that was fought to close by cyber attack. So we now have such a level of cyber security, we have to worry about, about an attack on the power grid, an attack on the, on the, you know, we have attack on the power grid, we have attack on the water system, what else, what is the next target? This is where now uh, we, we need to worry about catastrophic attacks. And I have to say that I do not sense, I, don't, I do not see a sense of crisis in my, my colleague in cybersecurity. They publish more papers, they go to conferences, the, the work goes on. But somehow I don't have seen people say the sky is about to fall. And I'm actually feeling this, the sky is about to fall. And I would say there is a deeper attitude, at least, at least in the United States, I cannot speak, I don't know what happened in other country, but there was an attitude of the tech community in the United States of what, I, what is called cyber libertarianism. So if we compare, uh, let's say the, the car industry. So the Ford Model T is now go back to 1908. Guess what? When you start driving cars, people, get, people die. So we have been working more than a hundred years to reduce uh, uh, fatalities from, from, from cars. And we've done a fantastic job. We've reduced fatality by about a factor of 50. So cars are much, much safer today. And partly because we've taken it very seriously. Okay, there is a National Transportation Safety Board. There's not National Cyber Security Board with the same authority to establish standards for the industry the way the NTSB can do. And when you talk about, we need more regulation, people jump all over me, immediately tell me regulation stifles innovation. Don't mess with, with, with you know, we like it with, with, no, with no rules and regulation. This, I think this era is about to end. And one, one place it should end, it's clear that tech has not been able to fix cybersecurity on its own. And there is a big question how to regulate. It's not an obvious question. There are many, it's really security is a techno-social problem. You need to understand it well. You shouldn't rush with, with stupid regulation, but without some uh, requirement on the industry, I don't believe industry will solve it on its own. Now, I kind of dump a little bit on computer science. I want to dump now in economics. So I want to go back to, back to economic efficiency. And I would argue that the relentless pursuit of efficiency prevented us from investing in getting ready for a pandemic. In spite of many warnings over the past several years, we, the, the, we, we have now pushed, there is a global supply chain that is very far from being resilient. So last February, Trump defended cutting the CDC budget. And what did he cut? He cut the office, the vaccine safety office. So it's a bit hard to imagine, but in 2019, the Trump administration closed down the CDC vaccine safety office. I mean, this should go in history in one of the biggest follies by any government. We knew there's a pandemic coming and we were not ready. So let me get a little bit into, into economic theory. So what do economists said about economic efficiency? They said economic efficiency means that goods and factor of productions are distributed or allocated to their most valuable uses and waste is minimized. So that's a notion of efficiency. This, this term I spent some time researching um, Investopedia. So, this is the notion of efficiency. And free market advocates argue that through self-interest and freedom of production, economic efficiency is achieved and the best interests of society as a whole are fulfilled. So there is a focus here by economists on, on, on resilience. Danny Roderick, a prominent uh, uh, economist, I think from MIT wrote just May, you know, economists tend to be enamored of the power of the market to promote overall economic prosperity. So when you go through some economic literature, you find some confusion between efficiency and optimality, okay? So if you go here, free market advocate talk about efficiency, but they also talk about the best interests of society as a whole are fulfilled, which is optimality. 
So the basic microeconomics 101, there's something called the first welfare theorem. And under certain assumption, if you have a free market, it will tend to, towards a competitive Pareto optimal equilibrium. Pareto op optimal means that no one can improve their situation. And so free markets, they are by, by, the same, by the theorem, free markets produce economic efficiency. But it's not clear, economic efficiency means equilibrium. It's not clear that equilibrium serve well the best interests of society. We need to distinguish between its equilibrium, does it serve society as a whole? So in, in uh, 1999, two computer scientists, Kotsopias and Papa Dimitriou, decided to understand this, this, this relationship between efficiency and optimality. And Kotsopias and Papa decided to look at there are many different equilibria. And each one may yield a different societal utility. So they said, let, let's look at the best equilibrium versus the worst equilibrium. And this is the way we very often compare algorithm in, in, uh, in computer science. We see what is the best outcome versus the worst outcome. And this ratio between the best and the worst is considered the price of anarchy because there are many equilibria. It's not clear which one will end. So, so the answer is that the price of anarchy can be very, very high. So even if you're in equilibrium, it doesn't mean that you're going to guarantee the best entry of society as a whole are fulfilled. So this is a, a, a superstition by economists that efficiency guarantees optimality. Efficiency does not guarantee optimality. But now I want to mention another paper, another paper by computer scientists, again by Patimitru, this one, this one is Doskalakit and, and Goldberg. And they ask, okay, a first world of theorem tells us that, um, that it takes, how long does it take to reach equilibrium? So the answer is to reach equilibrium, you need, you know, we have a sequence of steps, a sequence of local steps. A customer wants to buy a little more, a merchant sells a little more, it's a sequence of steps. And this is analogous to, to local search. And what they have shown is it may take exponentially long to reach equilibrium. But if it takes very long, it means that the market is never in equilibrium because things are likely to change. The weather will change, prices will change, demand fashion will change, all kinds of things will change. So a whole theory is based on equilibrium. And the answer is equilibrium does not guarantee optimality and the market is never in equilibrium. So it's not even efficient. It's a beautiful on mathematical model, but when you dig deeper, it never happens in reality. There is a, a huge gap between economic theory here and reality. But, but the mythology of free markets keeps going on. So in the, in the movie 1987, you may remember Michael Douglas playing Gordon Gico and he gave a fiery speech. Greed for a lack of better word is good. What is his argument? Adam Smith invisible hand, everybody is greedy, is greedy but somehow we're all doing better off. But every computer science student know that the algorithm gets stuck in local optima. And the only way to get out of there is to have systemic intervention. In fact, the whole idea of, of simulated annealing, annealing is to combine these greedy steps with global steps that get to get out of local, local optima. And so I would argue that right now in terms of cybersecurity, Somehow the market doesn't price security and privacy and resiliency enough. And I'll come back to that. I will consider a market failure. When the market fails, government to step in and change the boundary condition of the market in order to fix it. In fact, even business people now realizing. So part of what happened, you know, this mythology of the of greed is good, partly goes back to Milton Friedman, who in 1970 said companies should just focus the social purpose of cooperation is profit, nothing else. And in September of, uh, of uh, last year, it was 50 years later, the New York Times had a special issue dedicated to the legacy of, uh, of uh, Milton Friedman. And the, the headline was, greed is good except when it is bad. And they, they, they had, for example, Mark Benioff, the CEO of, Sales, of Salesforce write about his impression of this. I did not agree with Friedman then, and the decades since have only exposed his myopia. Just look at where the obsession with maximizing profits for shareholders brought us. Terrible economic, racial, and health disparities, the catastrophe of climate change. 
it's no wonder that so many young people now believe that capitalism cannot deliver the, the equal, inclusive, thermal future they want. And in fact, we talked about, we saw that the issue is American society as a whole, we saw that we saw that how many people were without food. And this had to do with that, uh, with the fragility of American society. And here I'm quoting an article by two millionaires, Nick Hanauer and David Rolf from September of last year. And they have analyzed and showed the top 1% of American have taken 50 trillion from the bottom 90%. So it left, it left a American society very, very precarious. So I want to go back to COVID-19 because science saved us. For example, imagine we'd not have a vaccine. Normally, normally it used to take five years to make a vaccine. mRNA technology gave us a vaccine in one year. This is just utter miracle. The other thing is, I bet that all of you continue to work. You just went to work from home. I went to work from home. I went to work from home, I shop from home, I teach from home, I learn from home, I'm giving talks from home, I'm seeing doctors from home. The internet held up. In February of last year, nobody heard about Zoom. And just imagine what happened to the, to the demand on Zoom. And it held up, by and large, it held up. And this is because the key design principle for the internet was redundancy. That's how part of how you build resilience. And this is an, actually an old idea when you go back to communication theory, error correcting codes. How do you deal with noise? Additional bits, extra bits, redundancy. In 1956, von Neumann wrote an article, how does nature build a reliable organism for unreliable cells? Redundancy. We now understand, you know, for example, after the financial crisis, we do bank stress tests. What does it mean? Banks need to have redundancy of capital. That's very inefficient because capital reserve are not productive, but they give us resilience. And it's really amazing to think what is the, the, the how did we get such, a, such reliable and resilient and robust communication infrastructure? And for this, we have to think to thank the Cold War. So in the 1960s, you had a cold war between, between the, the, the West and the, and the East, the Soviet Union and, the, and NATO. And the, both sides have nuclear weapons. And the strategy was mutually assured this destruction. For that to work, you had to eliminate the, the incentive for first strike. The worry was, what about the first strike? Suppose one side attacked the second strike and destroys their response capability. So you had to have a communication system that will be resilient to a nu first nuclear attack. And so the US design, this is Paul Baran, uh, designed the first distributed and redundant. The two prin the principle were distributivity, because if you, have a, if you have a central one, you can decapitate it, distributed and redundant. And this network, this network that was designed to survive nuclear attack saved our butt when it came to the when it came to the to the pandemic because if we could not have worked from home then one of the things will happen if, if either a much much deeper economic catastrophe or a much much worse pandemic so let me try to kind of summarize resilience is a fundamental but underappreciated societal need we need to learn from nature if you want to survive in the long term you need resilience uh, my own discipline has not emphasized resilient enough. Economics, I think, has not emphasized resilience enough. We need to do that. Part of the problem with economics is that very often they rely on the free market. But markets and people are actually very bad in planning for very low probability of very, very long-term events. For example, I have car insurance. I would probably have car insurance anyway, but, but it's, I don't have to... To, to decide on car insurance. If I want to renew my registration, now I just got yesterday renewal for registration. I have to, to renew it, I have to show proof of insurance. Why does the state require people to buy insurance? Because people cannot be trusted to buy car insurance because car insurance is very non-productive. It costs me money on the, I'm a good driver and uh, in the long term I pay much, much more money 
for premiums and I will probably recover, but I hope they continue this way. I won't have accident and it continue to be inefficient use of money, but it gives me resilience. And so society need to plan for resilience and that requires societal action. You cannot, you cannot rely on markets to do that. And we must remember the COVID-19, while it seemed like a huge crisis, maybe just a warm up act, a dress rehearsal for a bigger crisis, that climate crisis. So as it happens today, you know, we are now hearing about the Pacific Northwest bakes under a once in a life millennium, once in a millennium heat dome. It's once in a millennium. What do you bet that we'll have it again in five years, we will have the same heat dome in the Northeast. And British Columbia already are talking about 230 people dying from heat in British Columbia. Who would have thunk that this is possible? And, uh, and we can expect in the coming months to see California in the West Coast burning. And the amount of acreage burning every year goes up and up and up. As, as the pandemic was started to wind down in late 2020, uh, some columns start thinking what happens, what, when, who will we be when this is all over? Farid Zakaria wrote in the in Washington Post, the pandemic upended the present, but it's given us a chance to remake the future. Matt Simon in Wired wrote, the COVID-19 pandemic has brought incalculable suffering and trauma but it also offer ways for people and society to change for the better. And I think for years, we will talk about AC and BC, where BC will be before COVID and AC is after COVID. And I hope that our society will change and put resilience in the important place that it should be. Am I optimistic? I don't know that I'm optimistic because of this cartoon. This is a great cartoon. So you have a politician ask who won't change? Everybody raised their hand. Who wants to change? Everybody looks down. Nobody wants to change. This is our, our, our dilemma. We all want change. This is us. This is not someone else. This is us. We want change, but we don't want to change. And so will we master the will as a society to change and become resilient? I hope so. Thank you very much. Thank you, Moshe. That was uh, very illuminating. Um, I'd like to ask if anybody has questions. I have a question, if I may start. Sure, you're, um, the, mod mod you're the moderator, take your prerogative. <laughs> okay, so we know we have metrics for complexity. We have time complexity. We have average complexity, worst case. Um, we have space complexity. Is there a standard way to measure resiliency? Some sort of metric that we can hang on that will measure resiliency? So one of the reasons I give this talk is to start, and I made this talk, I mean, a little less technical because I wasn't sure about the audience, but I have some, I have some technical examples of how we can start to look at computer science and start to inject the lens of resilience. And, and resilience, I was actually there, you know, they, they talk about in elementary school, there are the three R's, like reading, writing, and arithmetic. And I think we have the three R's, which is resilience and robustness and reliability. And they're slightly different, okay? So reliability means that you are not, even under adverse condition, you're not failing. And robustness typically in control mean that, uh, that the, the disruption, you know, what, what is not robust? Imagine that somebody stands up and you give someone a small push and they fall down and have a big fall. What you want is if you push me a slight push, I will, I will bend down a little bit, but I will straighten, okay? So the, the disruption and the, and, the, and the effect should be somehow linearly related rather than you push me and poof, I fall down and I collapse and I break my hip and I, and I had a, a, a deep vein thrombosis and on and on and on, okay? Um, so I think we need to start, you know, people have studied, for example, there is fault tolerance. People have studied fault tolerance, okay? So you find isolated incidents. For example, you say Byzantine agreement is a classical algorithm in distributed system. And you say it should be able to sustain up to one third of, of failures, malicious failures. So you find in some pieces, fra fragments of these three Rs, but we have not made it to me an important topic that we, 
we study it, we investigate it, we develop metric, we develop theory, we have complexity theory, which is all about efficiency. We don't have resiliency theory. And because it just was not the focus of our attention. You know, again, you find error correcting code. They'll, they'll talk about how much, what is the tolerance of error. You'll find in different places. But I think we really need to start. And, and, and that's one reason why I go and I give this talk. I said, we don't have, people ask me, what is the precise way to measure? And I said, you know, if, if you go back in, a, let's say in the year 1950, and you ask someone, how do you measure the efficiency of algorithms? They didn't have an answer because they have not yet formulated it. You know, in fact, it was in the late 60s when somebody developed an algorithm for perfect matching. And it was polynomial algorithm. And this was Jeff, uh, Jack Edmonds. And he had to explain why polynomial algorithm is an important feature of an algorithm. Because before that, if you remember, before it was decidable, undecidable. Suddenly he came and said, no, no, it has to be in polynomial time. It was a whole new idea. I mean, now we just take it for granted that a good algorithm should run in polynomial time. But he had a starting point. Somebody made the case for that, okay? So, and in fact, partly we know what happened was people start running programs and they realize, gee, some problems we solve very quickly and some problem take forever to solve. What's going on here? We need to worry about efficiency. Knut start writing books about it. They start thinking about it. And, uh, and we're still developing it. And we still have open questions. So we're not, I don't expect that we will have, by next year, we'll have all the answers about resilience. But I'm hoping that we will make it a first-class citizen. We need to study it just as much as we study efficiency. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, I, uh, I, go ahead. Sorry, again, uh, OK, so uh, yeah, prof. So I, I was thinking in, term, in ID system, so there's this term called single point of failure, which is, which is quite common. Yep. Uh, commonly yep. used. Yep. I think it started with database, but now it's commonly used with everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but what, what is your opinion about uh, uh, being resilient by adding a, a redundancy into a system? So whether it's a database or whether it's the connections network or or with the application redundancy. So what is your opinion on that? Look, in, 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 in some areas, we you know, you go, you talk, some people say, oh, this is, this is, this, of course, you're, you're saying nothing new. I mean, we are selling, we've been doing raids, redundant array of independent disks. We've been doing it now for decades. Okay, I don't know when exactly when it starts. It was very obvious that you pay your bill if you, if you have, if each disk is unreliable and you want to, be, to build a reliable array, then you put, and you create an array of disks and that's how you get reliability by creating redundancy. And so I said, these ideas of redundancy to accomplish reliability was known. Uh, this is not a new idea. I said, probably, I think it goes back first to uh, the fact when I did my research, I fed back to error correcting code when, when it became very formalized that you need extra bits to, to, do, to do the error correcting code. And it shows up in many places. The other thing that people understood is that a single point of failure is, is very fragile. And therefore you want to combine redundancy, not just redundancy, for example, you know, if you want to have a backup, don't have the, all the backup in the same building because if there is fire, you want this to be somewhere else, right? So we are we are aware of these notions, but my claim is that they are they are applied sporadically in very specific situation, and we are not taking you know there's just no resilience theory. We're not we're not looking for example. I mean, the, uh, we teach students that uh, that. Uh, uh, bubble sort is a very bad algorithm for sorting because it's n square. But somebody asked, what happens if every time you do a comparison, you have a small chance, maybe 1% of making an error. So it turns out the bubble sort is a very resilient algorithm because this extra comparison operations, this redundant comparison operation means it's, it is self-correcting in a way that an optimized algorithm like quick sort is not. And so we need to start thinking about algorithm. When you say, what happened, you know, can they, for example, people discover now with machine learning, it became, it became sudden people talk about adversarial machine learning. Turns out that you can go and you take the, the deep learning, you can go and you, you can take a stop sign and change a few pixels. It's not, it's not even visible to the, to the eye, to the human eye, but uh, an AV would not see a stop sign anymore. By, and it's just not visible. You do put a little something that looks like dirt, a piece of dirt. 
and poof, the, you can, you can uh, fool uh, an AV. So people are talking now about how to fool face recognition. So one is when you understand the world is not benign, excuse me, shit happens. Rams, Donald Rumsfeld, who was secretary of uh, defense during the Iraq war just died today. And he famously said stuff happens. And he was right about that. I mean, when you, when you uh, uh, get ready for a war, you have to assume things will not always go according to plan. And how do people do it? One is, for example, there is the red, there is the, the blue team and red team, right? Somebody says, okay, what if this happens? When did that happens? Okay. You go and you try to poke hole in your design. And it turns out that the people who build the system very often are trapped in their own, they have the, the, the they have some biases that they build the system. So they are not willing to look at weaknesses. I've once looked at the paper, I wrote a paper, I sent it to someone. And he write me back, he said, you have a typo in your own name. I said, no way. I go and I look and he was spelled Noshe, not Moshe, but Noshe. And I looked at it, who knows, a hundred times. What happens? Because I expected it to be Moshe, I did not see the end. So that which, which we do not want to see, we don't see. It's well known, you know, our, our brain is, is, this is the confirmation bias. If I expected this is a Moshe, I read Moshe even when it's spelled Noshe. So you design a system, you're going to be oblivious to the weakness of your own system. So have someone whose job is to poke hole. And that's where the way, if you think about it, how we do science. In science, we take this approach, right? When you write a paper, nobody says, oh, you wrote a paper, you're famous, you got the Knuth Prize, we accept your paper. I have every paper I send is subject to review. Every proposal I send is subject to review. Is it a perfect process? No, but it means I cannot be fully trusted, okay? Because I can make mistake, I'm biased, all, all kinds of things. And therefore somebody else has to poke hole in my argument. So in science, we always take the skeptical approach to say, this is, we don't believe it until we have, we've subjected it to, to all kinds of ways of, of, of uh, criticizing it. Imagine we took this approach for every system. There is a team that says, okay, now how could it fail? What can go wrong? We don't do that. We have not taken, I believe, resilience. And, and this is not personally against anyone. Some places do better jobs than others. But the thing is that the community has not internalized to take this. You know, I, I, I live next to the largest medical center in the world and I go to take my wife to some appointment and I go by this sign with the Hippocratic Oath. And I'm thinking, suppose in computer science, we started the first thing we talk with, with all students. First, do no harm. So if you start to design a, any product, start with security. So what happened the typical way? And you saw it from the email that, uh, that my esteemed colleague wrote to me. First, we build features and functionality. And then we say, okay, what about security? Let's add security. Look what happened to the internet. So people who built it were brilliant. And they said, we will be the communication infrastructure and security will be an application level feature. And the answer is you can't. If you don't have secure, if you don't build secure, if TCP IP does not have security baked in, then every time people say application, the security will, will sit application level, people are finding a way to tunnel under the application and defeat security by going under the application. Uh, similarly with, uh, you know, Intel has a chip and they have security feature, but people are able to get under the security feature by side channel attacks, because the micro architecture leaks information, Spectre and Meltdown. And, and you find, well, there, is secure, there are security problems there. And so we, we are making the same mistake. The, the mistake was, it kind of hit me actually when I heard a, a radio an interview on the radio years ago with an architect of high rise buildings. And I remember the following sentence that he said. He said, people ask me, what's the difference between building a, a hundred stories building and 101 stories building? And they think it's very easy. You just add one more floor. He said, that's the wrong way to think about it. If you want to go from 100 to 101, what you need to think, I'm lifting the whole building one to make room for one more floor at the bottom. I need to revisit everything and lift the whole design and stick one more floor at the bottom. This is what happened when you add one story. 
So we think we can add security and privacy at the top instead of thinking it has to start from the bottom. So imagine that you build anything you build, you start by saying, let's think about security from day one before we think of anything else. What are the security and privacy and resilience and re reliability and you know, all of this? Well, how do we make sure we address them from day one? We haven't done it yet. I, some years ago, I, I visiting NSF and I talked to the, the, the assistant director of the, the boss of all of computer science research in NSF, the budget today, I don't know, it's like a billion dollar budget. And I said, I think cyber security is a crisis. He said, I agree with you, what should we do? I think we should give them more money. And he said, I can calculate how much it takes to produce a paper because I can look at how much money I give, and how many papers are published. And it turns out that roughly for $50,000 a year, you get a paper, I'll give or take. I mean, something, something like that. The student cost of a student and everything, about $50,000. So he says, okay, suppose that I'm going to invest, you know, another, you know, 100, 100, let's say $100 million in, uh, in security, okay? So that will create another 2000 papers in security. Will it change, will it move the needle? And he said, he said, honestly, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm very skeptical. I don't see, yes, we're doing lots of research. Are we moving the needle? And I think we haven't. And one reason I think in cybersecurity, we have not moved the middle because we kept thinking that this is a technical problem and it's a social technical problem. And until we admit the, 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 the social dimension of it and we'll bring people, we are nerds, we need to bring the people who understand something about, about other people. I mean, I always tell people why I explain to them what is computer science is in a nutshell. I said, I got into computing at age 16 because the rules, the, it was mentally challenging. It was like solving puzzles, very challenging, but it was, the rules were utterly clear and, and there was no ambiguity. Nobody was playing game with you. You know exactly what, what, what you're facing. I said, when it come, when age 16, when it come to girls, I was completely lost. So that's why I went to computing, okay? Later on, I did, didn't quite figure out girls, but I managed to, I managed to find someone who, who do someone to marry me. But uh, the point is that especially computing attracts people who are not always the most sophisticated socially, just, just be honest. And uh, so we need to team with social scientists to understand the social, social technical problem. We have one more question uh, briefly. I don't know how brief you can make it, but the question came from Dan Smith. Do you feel the upcoming era of quantum computing will be better for efficiency or resiliency? Yes and no, not, not necessarily. So on one hand, you know, I think it depends how we play it. I think quantum will make something easy and something hard, okay? Um, just for the record, I'm known as a, as a quantum computing skeptic. There are two types of quantum compute, computing skeptic. There are people who, who question whether the technology will ever be mature. The argument, there's some, there are people, oh, this is not my line, that there's fundamental problem with, with a noise, with quantum noise and, and what's called decoherence that say it would be very difficult to build such computers. I, I don't have an opinion on that. But uh, I looked at, uh, by now, quantum computing is about more than 25 years old. And you can ask yourself, how many quantum algorithms are there? And the answer is about 25. So, so it is incredibly hard to develop a quantum algorithm. So some of them are very important. For example, you can factor numbers. So if you can do that, now you need, just so you understand, I've seen some estimates that to factor 2000, if you have keys with 2000 bits, you'll need quantum computer with 100,000 qubits, with 100,000 qubits to factor them. And the, all the numbers I'm hearing now, we are in, in the people who make some claim, we're in dozens of qubits. And we will need to about 100,000 qubits to factor number. But suppose, suppose we go there and it will cost maybe suppose it costs $10 billion. Well, NSA will buy such a machine. So it's quite possible that RSA will die. On the other hand, quantum enable us, there is a whole people, 
uh, are missing the part of the big picture. There is area called quantum information processing. It looks more broadly at quantum and harnessing quantum than just quantum computing. Quantum computing is one aspect of it. But go and look at quantum information processing, for example. We have the ability to get to create entangled bits. Can we take advantage of that? There are some people who try to understand, you know, imagine this idea that I take, you and I take bits and we just store them somehow. We take a photon and we store them. And at some point we open the, we open the I op, open my photon, you open your photon and we know they must have uh, opposite uh, polarities. Can we take advantage of that? So there's a whole area of quantum information processing and there are people who are using quantum for encryption, the quantum based encryption. So I suspect what will happen at some point, RSA will die and maybe even a, a, what is the, the, the standard? What is the new standard now? Now I'm blocking off it. Uh, um, shell three. Hmm? Yeah. So the, the, current, the current system may die. On the other hand, we'll be able to harness quantum for, for security. So the same, it is, it, so quantum will be a generic technology. It's like, what will happen? Will AI increase security or decrease security? The answer is yes. You can use it to design attacks, but you can also use it to detect, you detect attacks. You know, it's like asking, you know, uh, if I have a Swiss knife, is it bad or good? Answer is, what are you doing with it? You can use it for good, you can use it for bad. So I don't think this, this technology will necessarily tip the balance in one direction or another. It's up to us how to use how to use the technology. And with that, uh, we are overspilling by a few minutes. I'd like to thank Professor Vardy once again and a round of applause. And uh, we, we have recorded it, and it's going to be posted on both our websites on Acronis and Acronis SES. Uh, and uh, thanks for joining us and we'll see each other again soon. Yeah, and my email Bye. is there. So I would welcome even the people who I just want to say for the recording, even people who watch it later, I would welcome comments, feedback and thoughts from people who watch it. Thank you guys very much. Uh, good you. night, good night and good morning. <laughs> Thank you, Prof. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it was very insightful. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.